Today I'm here in Ohio. I'm at the Butler County Sheriff's Department and I'm going to be interviewing Sheriff Richard Jones. Now many of you probably have heard of his controversial statement that he made a couple weeks ago where he said, if you shoot at the police, we are going to shoot back. Now that sounds like an obvious statement to anyone, right? We're going to talk to him about that question and many, many more. So, please watch. I'm here today with Sheriff Richard Jones of the Butler County Sheriff Department. Uh, my name is Martin Moyer. I'm president of Christian Action Network. Uh, Sheriff Jones, thanks for coming today to yes, be sir. part of our show. Appreciate it. So, I'm a bit concerned. Uh, I know that officers are well known for hunting down criminals and many of the other duties that we see in the newspapers. But I think that there's other things that policemen do that do not get a lot of recognition that citizens would appreciate learning about. Can you tell me some of those things? Sure. We save people's lives. We pull people out of cars that are crashed. Uh, we keep people from uh, hurting each other. Um, we prevent crime by being in certain places. Domestic violence, we're the first ones there to keep abuse down. Uh, we prevent people from driving drunk or driving impaired. Uh, we could talk about that all the time. Just our presence in the community stops crime. Uh, and remember, police, we live in your community. We go to your churches, we go to the stores, our kids go to the same schools, and uh, law and order is what this country was founded on. Uh, if you go all the way back to sheriffs in the uh, colonies, uh, uh, the first law enforcement they had was a sheriff, but they called them sheriffs. And George Washington's uh, father was uh, a sheriff in one of the colonies. So when you say law enforcement, we say we invented law enforcement. So we're there to help people feel safe. We help people, uh, elderly people. Uh, uh, when you see them on TV, we stop. We buy lemonade from the kids. We're in the schools. We talk to the kids. We teach them. If you need the police, call us. We're there for you. We're the good guys. So I've been reading and hearing from Black Lives Matter and Atifa groups and other radical anarchists that law enforcement can basically be replaced with social workers that are unarmed. <laughs> so do you think that's a possibility? Uh, I can't imagine that if there's a, a, a domestic violence and between two individuals and they want to send social workers. Police officers dread uh, domestic violence. They're mostly injured or shot with domestic violence. But I'm sure the police, to include myself, if they would rather send social workers, I'm all for that. Uh, we won't fight it. If you want to send social workers into dangerous situations, uh, social workers are the lowest paid people in the country of just about any profession. And so I can't imagine social workers would want to do that, but they're welcome to it if they want to. I promise you they won't like it. I promise. So what is the most dangerous part of being a law enforcement officer? What, what's the situation that is most dreaded to walk into? Domestic violence. And today it's changed so bad that when you put your uniform on and you go leave your home and get in your car, it starts there. Uh, people assault police officers just in their car. They assault them at their houses. They assault them in restaurants. They kill them. Uh, there, there is no safe place anymore. Uh, the most dreaded call is domestic violence or a shooting. Uh, it, it never ends well. Um, and our country has, has gotten worse. And kids and young people have no respect anymore for each other, it seems like and they're being taught at home not to trust the police, not to trust the government, and they grow up, and we see it here. We see it all over the country. And it's dangerous from when you first put your uniform on, and it never stops. Even when you're not working, it never stops. Yeah, so speaking about the dangers of being in law enforcement, so I'm kind of astonished that so many police chiefs are resigning throughout the country. Uh, Dallas, uh, Atlanta, Rochester, uh, Seattle. That's a lot of police chief brass that's 
decided to hang up their uniform and get out of the business. So I'm wondering, are police officers now living on the edge, uh, say sitting on a, uh, a, a, a box of uh, eggs and afraid to perform their jobs? Is this putting them at risk? Uh, the police officers you talk about, the police chiefs that are resigning, those are all good police chiefs in big cities. And they're all African Americans for the most part. And I think it doesn't fit the narrative of the protesters that uh, African Americans can be police chiefs in big cities, so they they run the police chiefs off. They cause them grief. They and some of the best police chiefs you've seen that you've talked about are leaving, and uh, a majority of them are African American. Good police chiefs, and they've worked their way to the top, and they've they've made them leave. Their leaders have made them leave. Uh, they work for mayors and city council people, and they've thrown them under the bus. It doesn't matter if you're white or black. They've thrown police and police chiefs and police leaders under the bus. And police chiefs aren't allowed to speak out. If you do, they'll fire you. Uh, sheriffs can. I can speak out. The reason I can speak out is my bosses live in the community. They're my boss. I get hired and fired every four years. The voters hire and fire me. I don't work for any bureaucrats. I don't work for city managers. I don't work for county commissioners. I work for the people and I get hired and fired every four years. So I can say what I think, I'm not controlled, and when it comes to saying what I think, uh, until I go home, uh, then my wife, uh, I'm kind of scared there. So feel sorry for me, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but what I'm telling you is, you can be strong and you can stand up. I've heard from police all over the country and even other countries. Uh, they want to say what I'm saying, but they're afraid to say it, but I'm not. So, will Black Lives Matter and TIFA actually win by default because police chiefs will resign, police officers will resign, they'll have a more difficult time recruiting new officers into law enforcement? Uh, because it seems like we don't have to actually defund or abolish the police department, we can just ruin them from within, make it impossible for them to do their jobs or to recruit, recruit people who want to do those jobs. No. Uh, this isn't the first time I've seen protests. You're old enough to remember. I know you're only like 20 years old, but I'm a little older than that. As a child, I can remember the, the riots of the 1960s right. and the police and the police being assaulted. This is not new. Uh, and if you want to know the future, there's an old saying, all you got to do is turn around and look over your shoulder, look at your past. And this too shall pass. Uh, right now, it's it's coming up. and People have uh, 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 ambushed and took over this movement of protest uh, against the police. Peaceful protest is a good thing. Our country was founded on peaceful protest, and then it turned ugly. But peaceful protest is in our Constitution, and you should be allowed to peaceful protest. I have protested in my life, uh, but I protested for more money and marched for more money. And uh, so protest is a good thing. Standing up for what you believe in is a good thing. Burning buildings down, assaulting people, um, uh, looting buildings, that's not a peaceful protest. Setting people on fire, shooting people, going to a protest with shields, helmets, mace, homemade torches, bullets, rocks, bricks. Now, that's not a peaceful protest. Bad things will happen. And what these leaders have done in these communities, they send the police out to absorb this like a punching bag. And then they tell them, you can't do nothing about it because this is peaceful protest. And police are quitting, police chiefs are resigning, but it's it will continue to come back and this too shall pass and we'll get past it. And But people are tired, regular people that are tired. I don't care where you live. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're a Democrat, a Republican, a man or a woman, or how you uh, claim to be yourself to be, whatever that is, people want safe communities. I don't like to quote Al Sharpton at all. It makes me sick to my stomach. But Al Sharpton said a few days ago, people that need the police the most are the people in poor communities that need the police. And when he says that, he says, you can't defund the police. If you want to see what happens when the police leave, that's why when people in communities 
have shootings in their communities and are in tough neighborhoods. They don't talk to the police because when the police leave, they'll kill you. Imagine if there's no police in the communities, the gangsters, the thugs, the punks take over. And excuse my language, but I, I, I'm not putting a filter on today. American people are tired, they're wore out. This, this uh, Chinese disease, this COVID-19, whatever you want to call it today, has wore people out. There's mistrust in government, but we are a resilient country. I've seen more flags flying in more states and in more areas, U.S. flags. The last time I seen an insurgence of flags was after 9-11, which is what we're here doing today uh, in honor of 9-11. I've never seen so many flags out, and I'll tell you why. It's the silent majority. Doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, again, uh, man or woman, doesn't matter. People, this is still the best country in the world to live. And when people say they'll leave if so-and-so gets elected president, nobody left. Uh, so I assume they're going to say it again this time, but they're not going to leave. I'll even start a GoFundMe page if some of them will leave and help pay their flights. Now, I'm sure you knew this question was going to come up. So recently you said, you shoot at the police, expect us to shoot back. Now, my question to you is, that's such an obvious statement. Why did you feel you needed to let people know that? Because people are under the misconception that you can shoot at the police and they won't shoot back. That's what the media says. That's what other people in a, a government officials say. Shame on them. They try to convince people that you can shoot at the police. They won't shoot back. You're allowed to shoot at them. You can shoot them four or five times. Shoot them before they can shoot back. If you've got a knife and are attacking the police, they convince people that you can do that. The police won't shoot you. Then they attack the police and say, that they only stabbed you two times. You didn't have to shoot them, uh, which is nonsense. Sometimes people forget the basic common sense. You don't only have to not shoot at the police. If you look like, if you have a weapon and they tell you to drop your weapon and it looks like you're gonna use that weapon to shoot the police, or stab the police, or hit them in the head with a brick. They will shoot you. That's common sense. A brick is deadly force. It will kill you. If you took a brick to the head, more than likely it will kill you or you won't know who you are the next part of your life. So sometimes common sense, keep it simple, stupid. Sometimes it's, it's called kiss. You've got to remember that the police will shoot you. They go home every right. night and I'm not afraid to say that. They're allowed to. So yesterday, last evening, I was reading a story that took place in Houston where four officers were fired from their jobs for shooting dead a criminal who pointed a taser at them in the dark of night. Are you familiar with that story? Uh, I know very little of it, but I can tell you this much. Don't believe whatever you first hear and see in the media. No matter what first video they show you, there's probably a hundred videos. So to second guess anybody, if I'm in the middle of the night, it's dark, and I'm in a spot and somebody pulls a taser out, I don't know if that's a gun, a taser. Uh, they, they make guns now that uh, for kids' sakes or for the police officers' sake, that are different colors. So you can tell if they're a real gun or not so the police won't shoot you. So what the bad guys do, they paint these guns to look like toy guns. So a taser is bad. A taser can dis disable you. And when they say this person was unarmed, they weren't unarmed. A taser can disable you or disable whoever you're with. I don't know if it was a, a corded uh, taser. I don't know if it was one that you can touch somebody or shoot them from a distance. Then you can take their gun. When they say this person was, uh, many times in the media, this person was unarmed and uh, the police officer shot them, but they were fighting, they were wrestling. I call that a jump ball. Anytime the police officer is wrestling, fighting with somebody, they're trying to keep their gun because a lot of police officers are killed with their own handgun. So I'm not gonna pass judgment on somebody at dark or even the daylight that points a taser at somebody, a police officer, and they tell you to drop that taser Police officers don't have to be hit with a taser before they can do anything. Um, uh, and are they, is the person gonna take their weapon away at that time? I don't know what this person was wanted for. 
Did he kill people? Did he, was he speeding? No, my judgment is uh, guarded and I wanna see the whole story and I wanna see what it says. It's awful quick to fire somebody uh, that happened that quick. Uh, the police officers, it appears at times, have no justice. They don't get a right to a trial, a right to defend themselves. Politicians, a lot of them are weak and throw them under the bus for their election. They're like the willow tree that bends like this. A crowd over there convince them, they'll bend like this. The oak tree stands up strong. You gotta have the police. Are we perfect? No. Do we make mistakes? Sure we do. In the heat of battle, when you're having to pull your gun, remember, police officers don't want to do that. They want to go home every night. They don't want to fight with people. They don't want to wrestle with people. They would rather their radio not get, we call it, not crack your radio one time. That means not have to answer a call all night. But that's not the way it is. So I'm not going to pass judgment, but I am going to tell you, a taser at dark or taser in the daylight, I'd have to see. I, what would I do if I'm out somewhere and somebody pulls a, tase, a taser on me? I would think they're going to try to get my gun away. I can't be disabled. If I have my gun out already, why do I have my gun out? What's the reason I have my gun out? I don't know the rest of that story. I don't think you do either. Don't know what that person was stopped. But if somebody comes up right now and I'm by myself or I'm with a partner, they tase me, that's one person down. So there you go. Hopefully it was a long answer, but hey. No. Uh, it was a very good answer. Um, I know it is. <laughs> uh, you've been doing a lot of media interviews, both nationally and internationally recently. Would you say that a lot of that is because uh, you have a belief that the mainstream media is actually promoting the cause to defund and abolish the police? Sure. Uh, it, it almost seems like it's divided by channel, by politics by where you live. Um, used to, the media was the media. It's more entertainment now. It's 24-hour news, so they've got to say something. And it's all about their advertisement, their viewership. It's, the country is divided. It almost seems equally uh, Democrat, Republican. It's divided down the middle. And each side tries to feed raw meat to whatever side pays the bills. And I believe the media can fan things. I've had the media accuse me of when I speak that I'm fanning things and making people angry by what I say. When I said the police will shoot back, I'm not fanning it. I'm trying to save people's lives. I'm trying to tell people, you can't do these things. Don't think you'll get a free ride. And, it's, and if you're in uh, Portland and you can riot for over 100 days and you can throw things at the police and, have, and attack the police, you go somewhere else, it might not be so good for you. So I have a tough question for you because I think it's a tough question for anybody to answer. Uh, would you categorize any of the recent national headlines on the George Floyd, Daniel Prude, and Jacob Blake cases as being police abuse? Police are like everybody else. There's bad police, there's bad preachers, there's bad news people. Uh, Everybody makes mistakes, and I'm not going to hold judgment till I see all of the information. I only get to see what you see, which is what the news puts out. I don't see everything, and a lot of times the real story doesn't come out yet. Police make mistakes, and when they do, they should pay for it appropriately. Far less mistakes, they do far more good than what is being portrayed in the media. All right, this is kind of a, um, perhaps a long-winded question, but an Ohio school superintendent, Michael Hanlon Jr., Jr., recently banned players from bringing out the thin blue line flag in Ohio prior to sporting events. Now, here's what he said. He said the thin blue line flag could be interpreted as a racially motivated action and therefore not acceptable in a school community. You live in Ohio, he lives in Ohio. I want to ask you the question, are we now headed in a direction where simply wearing the police uniform is now a racist symbol? Well, I want to get back to the person that made that statement, okay? Right. He's an idiot, 
okay? And sorry if I offend him or offend anybody. The thin blue line is the support of police officers. If you'll look at our monument here, we have a thin blue line. It's the line that the police walk every day and it's what we celebrate. It's an American flag. With, and you know what firemen have? They have a thin red line. It's an American flag. Are the firemen bad? Uh, are they racist because they, they support the flag and they're proud of what they do? No, it's, it's just a bunch of liberal people that don't want you to be together that don't want you to band together, that don't want you to have anything and celebrate anything that has the flag on it. The American people are tired and they're wore out and it's still a country and the American flag is our country flag. I can remember in school where I stood up every morning and said the Pledge of Allegiance and said the Lord's Prayer before we started class in public schools. Mm -hmm. So, no, uh, did I say he was an idiot? Yes, I did. And, and I won't back off that. He's an idiot. Okay. Um, so my final question to you is, there has been a lot of demonstrations in favor of the police recently. Uh, we see them taking place, uh, sometimes well-organized, sometimes just out of the thin blue air. Uh, they become organized. I want to ask you, how important are these demonstrations for law enforcement? They're important, but not necessary. We, we don't need people to stand up and say that we're doing a good job. We just need to know that we're getting it from our churches, from our community, and where we live. We know they like us. And it's a small group that doesn't like us. These protesters, they're small groups, a couple hundred, 300 people, but uh, we know that right where you're standing, right here, the first year after 9-11, which is the day we're filming this, 9-11. We had a ceremony here today. The year after that, we had a parking lot of probably two, 300 policemen and firemen standing here and marching in order down this street all the way to our city, uptown. We had a huge ceremony. Cars were stopping. People were saluting. People were crying. They were so excited for the first responders. It makes me tear up telling you this. About three or four years later, it got smaller and smaller and smaller. Today, we've done our ceremony here, just with us. We don't need kudos or thanks. We get that every day in our community. We know, and we know people are afraid to come out and say things. We know that the media and people in certain walks of life don't want the police to be looked on in a favorable way. And, but believe me, the people that need the police the most. When you have power failures in big cities, you see what happens, total chaos. People in neighborhoods that need the police, without them, the gangsters and the thugs take over. They're the police. So, but they're afraid to say, we know what they want. But when you go to New York City for the past two years and you see what they've done to the police, they have 35,000 police, policemen there. One of the biggest police forces in the world, bigger than some armories, armies and they've, they've worked the police over. Their mayors, their government has, and they throw cold water or water on their heads, and they just bow their heads and go to their police cars. Those police officers in New York make forty to $50,000 a year. Who would want to be a policeman there for that? If they paid 100000 who would want to be a policeman there? Thank God that they're there, and it's dangerous, and they assault people. People are moving out of these big cities. So you got to keep that in mind. You see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. So how long have you been Sheriff of Butler County, uh, Sheriff's Department, and do you plan on resigning? Uh, basically, I've been here 26 years. This is my fourth term as Sheriff. I'm the longest sitting Sheriff in Butler County since 1953. And this term I'm running unopposed. And I'm going to stay here. There's no term limits. There's no age limits. As long as I'm healthy enough to do it, I'm going to stay right here as long as people want me to. And when it comes time, they'll tell me. And right now, I speak for the people that hire me. They don't have a voice. I have a voice and I represent them. I've been to the White House. I've been to the border several times. Um, uh, and I speak my piece and I say what I think. And when I first started, 
they try to call you all kinds of names and try to change your opinion, but I don't scare easy. So 26 years, that's a, a lot of years you plan on running again. So you must find this job uh, rewarding. Uh, what is the reward of being a sheriff in this day and age? The reward is one person can make a difference. 350 million people in this country, and you're here interviewing me. There's a lot more people you could interview besides me. So hmm. I have a voice. I was come from a very poor background. I come from a family of five brothers and sisters. Four of my brothers, to include myself, all slept in the same bed, and I was a bedwetter. They, I can tell you where I never slept. I never slept in the middle. I slept on one side or the other side. Our utilities would be cut off, our phone would be cut off. Sometimes I didn't have lunch money. My mom made syrup for our pancakes with sugar and water. I didn't starve to death. And uh, I learned how to flush a toilet without running water. You go down and you drain the hot water tank and people think toilets are electric, they actually flush with water. And so I learned a lot being poor. I, I wore my brother's ice skates. His shoes size was much smaller than mine, but I made them fit. And you know what? We had one hockey stick and it was passed down from brother to brother to brother. I couldn't wear their clothes because I was much bigger than them. So, and here I am, I've been to the White House. I've met the president several times. I've warmed him his act, his act of running for president, that was me on the stage, warming the stage up, 25,000 people. So the reward is I can make a difference, and I have. And my family are all in law enforcement, and I tried to, uh, to get my family to do, my, my kids to do other professions, but they can't help it. And uh, uh, my mother tried to convince my wife, before we got married, don't marry a policeman. It, it's very difficult, and it is, because being married to a police officer, man or woman, is very difficult. And you're always on guard, you're always watching people, that's what you're trained to be. And you're trained to look at people with a crooked eye sometimes, and to look for danger. That doesn't go away when you go home or when you try to go on vacation. So it's very rewarding in my heart that I make a difference. Well, Sheriff Jones, I think we could probably talk another hour or two because I think you would have a lot to say, and I think our viewers would love to hear the next two hours if we could stay on for another two hours. But I want to thank you for being a part of our program today and also thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that I was told that, uh, that I get asked a lot for concealed carry and wearing a mask. In Ohio, can you wear a mask if you have a concealed carry. Yes, you can. Now, what we ask, if you're gonna commit a crime and you have that mask on, if you at least have the decency to pull that mask down so we could identify you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, we, sure we get that message out there because that's an important thing for them to know. Sure it is. <laughs> All right, I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a wrap. Thank you very much, Sarah Jones. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to end that on a a fairly funny note when we were doing it. Yeah. With it, you could at least take your mask down. <laughs> I don't know if it makes your cut or not, but it, well, no, that was a very important question my board member wanted me to ask you. Okay, you got it. <laughs>